Thank you, Andrea. And Andrea, if you will pick out something for an invitation song. Kind of a tough situation, you know. I, I don't want to get people sick, but I want to be here. And so how do you make that happen? So uh, and then Alice is sick, so we're kind of running half steam here. This morning, we're going to be in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, if you'll turn there. I appreciate it. I've got all sorts of stuff up here. i got two of these life, three lifesavers. i got the one that's red. I might have to get into that one. I got a cough drop. I understand I got a pharmacy back here. <laughs> so that's good. Thank you very much. Um, let me go ahead and Matthew chapter eleven. Matthew eleven verses one and following. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now I'm reminded of last uh, Sunday's message, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. And here... You have John asking, are you the one that we are looking for? Um, and the message this morning is, art thou he? Art thou he? As I pray, you pray that God would do a work in our heart and life. Let's make this a different Sunday than just a normal Sunday. Let's make this a special Sunday. For we have the promise through, God, through God's word that he's here with us through his Holy Spirit. So let's be aware of that and take advantage of that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak to us this morning. God, in our Sunday school class this morning, we talked about truth, and here we have the truth before us, and God, we just want to wrap ourselves in your truth. Father, I would ask that you teach us this morning through your Holy Spirit, through your word. Now, Father, may I be out of the way and just insignificant. I don't want to be uh, other than just uh, the mouthpiece, just, but God, you are the one that has to teach us. So, Father, I pray for your leadership and direction. I pray, God, for those that are here this morning that may have come with a heavy heart and they've got issues and problems. Lord, I'm reminded that your, 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 your word says, take my yoke upon you, for your, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Uh, God, I pray that you would uh, uh, reach, be able to reach down and, and uh, minister to the hearts of those that are heavy laden. God, I'm again reminded that we must open our heart's door to you if you're going to do a work. So God, we, we know that you're an awesome God, but we just must avail ourselves to your working in our lives. Uh, God, I pray that we would uh, be witness and t witnesses and testimonies of the works that you've done in our hearts and lives. We pray for those that may be here this morning and perhaps they don't know you as Savior. God, we'd ask that today might be the day of their salvation. And God, may we be fully aware of those around us, our surroundings, spiritually aware, discerning those moments when you have made some divine appointments and we just need to keep them. Have your will and way, I pray this morning. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. <clears throat> Art thou he? <coughs> Art thou he? I can remember several years ago walking through... Um, LAX, and uh, I looked over, I'm going to say a name, I'm going to see how many people know this name, Red Buttons, Red Buttons, okay, Red Buttons, okay, he was an actor, movie star, and I saw him walking through, and I thought, is that, is that, sure enough, and I got close enough to him as he walked by, I realized he had a life just like the rest of us. As he was talking to his significant other there, I guess it was his wife, and I heard him say, okay, okay, we'll do it your way. Uh, but that was red buttons. And then, oh, a lot of years ago, I was in junior college and was playing baseball, and we went to, uh, I think it was Chabot College. It's kind of over, anybody know where it's at? Over kind of in the Bay Area. Very nice field. And uh, 
as we were walking into uh, the clubhouse to get changed out to, to play, a guy walked out. And it was during a time when they were having a baseball strike. And this guy walked out. And I didn't even look at him when he walked out. But Ruben, the uh, pitcher was one year ahead of me, looked at him and he goes, hey, hey, uh, you're a, uh, you're a, uh, and he kept, just kept walking. You're a, uh, you're a, uh, he just kept walking. And he probably got from here to the back door there. And he goes, you're Raleigh Fingers. I mean, you know the name Raleigh Fingers. Anybody? Okay. And he turned around and he goes, you know, it's not like that. Raleigh Fingers was a pitcher with the uh, Oakland Athletics many years ago. Played on world championship teams. But, you know, sometimes you're wondering. You get out and you see people and you go, is, what's that? Did I just, is that, is that who I, I think it is? Well, over 2,000 years ago, something supernatural, something totally out of the ordinary, something humanly unexplainable happened. We believe, from God's word, and it teaches that God invaded our world in the form of a baby. In the form of a baby. Now, that's a stunning thought when you think about it. That he came into our world. We sing the song, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, Hail the incarnate deity. And that's what it's talking about. The child, God, being born as a baby into the world. We sing those words a lot of times, these songs, and we don't even recognize what we're saying. But that's what we're singing about. Something that had never happened before happened that day. And it has never happened since. It only happened one time. We believe that a long time ago in a tiny village where there was no room in the inns, they had to go to a baby to a, a stable where a baby was born in a stable. All that time, most thought, that's eh, just another baby. Just another exhausted mother. Just another concerned father. And I, 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 I'm going to digress for a second here because I was talking to Hector this morning. And, and is Val five months pregnant? Cinco? Okay. All right, and then we were talking about when the baby was going to be born, and I said, she doesn't want to go into 10 months, so whenever. So women are just nine months. I think elephants are like 15 months, and I don't think we want to go that long. So we're just going to do a nine-month pregnancy. Okay, all right. So are we looking at April, or are we looking at May? May, okay, all right. Back to the message. Sorry, I had to get that taken care of. But just another concerned father. Jesus wasn't the only baby born in Bethlehem, though, probably that night. You know, I looked it up. They estimate that every day, anybody want to guess how many babies are born in a day? How much? Oh, that's not a bad guess. 360,000 babies. 360,000 babies born in a day. Now, back in that time, there weren't not as many people, so obviously not as many, but several thousand, several thousand. But of all the babies born that night, there was something different about this one baby. And it has never happened since, and it never happened before. You know, what are the chances? What are the chances? When it comes to Christmas, we confess that the Christmas carols Behind them, behind the decorations and the parties, behind the sermons, behind all the lies of, of the historical truths that over 10,000 years ago, God became man in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We not only believe that, but we stake our lives upon it. I stake my life upon that. I stake my eternal security in heaven upon that. But what if it wasn't true? What if it wasn't true? Someone once said, if Jesus is not your savior, Christmas is not your holiday. It's very true. If Jesus is not your savior, if you sit here this morning, you do not know Jesus Christ as your savior, Christmas is really not your holiday. And you read the story of Christ's birth, you can't miss the fact that many people weren't ready for his coming and still many people didn't believe it. Uh, I'm sure that even among that those that knew Mary and Joseph had their doubts. So the question becomes, 
Is it true? Did he really come? Is Jesus really the one? Or back to the question, art thou he? Art thou he? It's an honest question. We need to go back to Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> it's the story of John the Baptist who was in prison because he had confronted King Herod about his flagrant immorality. And so, you know, that something happens when you speak up <laughs> and say things that people don't like. Those in charge can t get, get after you. So at any rate, so while he was in prison, John the Baptist had this question. And it goes right to the heart of Christmas. Let's read it again. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Are you the one? And our... 21st century vernacular. Are you the one? Jesus, are you the one? Are you really the son of God? Or should we look for somebody else? Today we're going to consider a sevenfold answer. Sevenfold answer of Jesus, are you the one? <clears throat> There's many lines of evidence that we might follow to answer the question. And Bible scholars tell us that in the Old Testament, it contains over 300 references to the coming Messiah. Over 300 references. If you start into Genesis and you go to Malachi, you can find something virtually in every book about the promised Messiah. So are you the one? Number one, first thing we see is he was born of a woman. Back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Go ahead and turn there if you will. Genesis 3.15, in a moment after Adam and Eve had uh, sinned against God, feeling guilt and shame, they hid from the Lord. And this is what the Lord said to the serpent who deceived them. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. We find three sentences of judgment in this verse. First, there's going to be an ongoing hostility between the serpent and the woman. Eve now knows that the serpent can't be trusted. Can't trust that serpent. Secondly, there'll be two lines of humanities constantly at odds against each other. Those who will fight for Satan and those who will fight for Christ. And thirdly, there will come the someone that he will ultimately destroy the serpent's power. The, serpents, the serpent will strike the heel in the crucifixion. But the same event, Messiah will crush the serpent's head. One's a bruise, one's a death blow. First part of the verse, hark the herald angels sing. Come desire, us, come desire of nations, come. Fix in us thy humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. Again, one of those songs we sing, but we don't pay attention to. Where do you find his fulfilled promise? Look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. That's where we find this promised. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And then over in Galatians 4, 4, it says this. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. He was born of a woman. We're asking the question, art thou he? And we're looking back at the prophecy of the Old Testament. Secondly, Supposed to be a descendant of Adam. Supposed to be a descendant of Adam. Go to the first verse in the New Testament. That would be Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, right? The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. A lot of times we grow weary when we're reading the generations. You know, you're reading through your Bible and you're reading the generations. You go, oh, 
And you go in Genesis, there are several lists of generations, and you'll have all these names, and then you'll have all the offspring, and in the book of Ruth, and 2 Samuel, and other places. Sometimes you go weary. That's some good information here to find in this Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Born of Abraham. Born of Abraham. We know that from Genesis chapter 12 that God intended to bless the whole world through the descendants of Abraham. But he was an old man. He was an old man. And he was married to an old woman. They'd been married for a while, but they were old. And God promised. And God did a miraculous thing in that he allowed them at age 100. And she was 90 when she gave birth. Ladies, I don't think many of you would want to be 90 and give them birth. My goodness. It's tough enough uh, to watch a woman. Uh, you know, I watched all four of our babies being born, and it was, oh, my goodness. It was a tough thing. But 90 years old, what a miracle. What a miracle. And because that, then your line begins. You have Abraham, you have Isaac, you have Jacob. You have the sons of Jacob, you have the 12 tribes, you have the nation of Israel. And then 2,000 years later, Jesus was born of the line of Abraham. Thirdly, supposed to be from the tribe of Judah, tribe of Judah. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. Go ahead and turn there with me, if you will. <coughs> Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Jacob was predicting Messiah. Messiah will come from Judah. It's interesting. We went through a series of lessons on Joseph. Joseph, man, what a, what a man of God Joseph was, is. And yet, the line did not come through Joseph came through his brother. You know, God's ways are not my ways. You know, sometimes we think, I would do it this way. You know, certainly, from the start, when he was born in a manger, well, he should be born in a palace somewhere. And yet, he pecked the humble, lowly way. The Bible says he's to be from the tribe of Judah. Luke chapter 1, verse 33. Turn there. Luke chapter 1. Verse 33 tells us, <clears throat> and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And in Revelation 5.5, 5, the Bible calls him the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we've got three uh, prophecies here that have been fulfilled. fulfilled. Fourthly, he shall be a descendant of David, the Bible says. David. <clears throat> we can go ahead and turn back there to 2 Samuel. Chapter 7. Second Samuel 7, verse 12. Second Samuel 12, and when thy days shall be fulfilled, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the men, uh, children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I look it from Saul, took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, it clarifies the promise by stating that a ruler will come who shall be a glorious, will be a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, 
and shall execute judgment and judgment in the earth. He will rule with wisdom and understanding. Who else would that be? Who else would be? be? Go back to Matthew chapter 1 1. <clears throat> What's it say there? G Matthew 1 1. That was Jesus Christ, the son of David. When Gabriel came to Mary, he told Mary that her son would bear would be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David in Luke chapter 1 verse 32 so four prophecies are fulfilled he's going to be announced by John the Baptist number five number five now you talk about how you're going to be announced well, I'm getting ahead of myself when, when Isaiah prophesied, this was over 700 years before Christ, he predicted a forerunner would announce the coming of the Messiah. <clears throat> Isaiah 40, verse 3, I'll read it. It says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before him. Now we go back to Mark chapter 1. Let's turn to Mark chapter 1 together. Mark chapter 1, and beginning in verse 4, <clears throat> excuse me, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locust and wild honey. He must have been an odd sight, an odd sight. You know, I don't know, if you're promoting something, you want something that's gonna look good. You look at the commercials on TV, they always have somebody that's handsome or pretty, and they're displaying product X. Well, not Jesus, not God. He brought this old John out there, and he was a, kind of a strange looking guy. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed shall have baptized you with water, but he <clears throat> shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> you have Isaiah 40, you have Malachi 3, fulfilled in Matthew 3. Matthew 11, Mark 1, Luke 1, on and on, Luke 7. The New Testament writers understood the Old Testament prophecies and they were fulfilled in John the Baptist. Six, he must be born of a virgin. He must be born of a virgin. When King Ahaz doubted God's promise, the Lord said, I'm going to send a sign to you. You'll be surprised. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Turn there, if you will. Isaiah 4, 7, 14. <clears throat> says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I mean, to have heard this pronounced, somebody say that you're going to be born of a virgin. Well, how does that happen? That just doesn't happen. And no matter how Ahaz understood us, he, he could never have foreseen that 700 years later, God would bring it to pass the miracle of a virgin birth. <clears throat> we don't have to wonder about it because the angel spoke to Joseph in a dream. He said, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets saying, and that's back in Matthew chapter 1, 22, and he was quoting Isaiah 7, 14. And then it's, he needs to be born in Bethlehem, born in Bethlehem, <laughs> so that this, this starts narrowing down who this Jesus is. <clears throat> Not only was the Messiah going to be born of a virgin, but the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5.2 says this, But thou, Bethlehem, Epaphra, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, 
Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Bethlehem, a small, insignificant. How many have ever been to El Centro? El Centro, okay. Huh? Born, there. Born there? Okay. It's one of those towns, it's one of those towns where you go, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. Yeah. You can see it from there. And, I mean, it's kind of an in, insignificant place, uh, but not to some people. And I'm glad that you're here today, Don. <laughs> Praise God for your being born there. But Bethlehem, would the king be born in Bethlehem? <clears throat> well, the wise men knew it. The wise men showed up in Jerusalem were looking for the one born king, born uh, the king of the Jews. King Herod asked the scribes about it. And they quoted Micah 5.2 to him. And you know, as if it was easy to say to them, everybody knows the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 1. That's a joke because they didn't have it then. They didn't have it then. But this prophecy of Micah is not a made-up sermon illustration. Sometimes you'll hear sermon illustrations, and they've been fashioned to uh, make a point, but not this. This is the truth. It predicted where Christ would be born 700 years in advance. 700 years in advance. We're talking about art thou he. Art thou he. Let's recap, re recap this. Recap this. There's seven prophecies about the birth of Christ. First, he was born of a woman. Second, he was a descendant of Abraham. Third, he must be from the tribe of Judah. Fourth, he must be a descendant of David. He must be announced by John the Baptist. He must be born of a virgin. He must be born in Bethlehem. Seven different prophecies uttered by five different people over 1,200 years. And all of them were fulfilled in the birth of Christ. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a child is given. Do you, you realize that that promise rings true here today? Unto me a child was born. Unto me a son is given. Who is he? He's exactly as God had promised. I, Acts chapter 10 verse 43 says, To him give all the prophet witness. All the prophet witness. Luke 24, 25, then said he unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All that the prophets have spoken. Could this have happened by chance? Consider how these prophecies fit together. Born of a woman. Born of a woman. Well, a lot of people fit into that category, right? How many were born of a woman? They're here this morning. No? That's everybody. That's 100%. But then it goes on and says he's a descendant from Abraham. That kind of narrows it down a little bit. All right? Then it says from the, from the tribe of Judah. Well, that's starting to get a little bit narrow. Can you see us kind of going down like this, the odds of it being somebody else? A descendant of Abraham, uh, of David, even more narrow. Announced by John the Baptist. That's bringing it down pretty narrow now. Pretty narrow. Born of a virgin. Hey, that just puts it into a category of one. There's none else. A category of one. Born in Bethlehem. That's extremely specific. Extremely specific. I mean, today we, we uh, mothers are pregnant and they go to the doctor and they have the hospital picked out and they know where they're going to, that baby's going to be born. Most of the time. I remember a friend of mine, uh, Scott and Kathy had two children. And uh, they lived in Whittier and we lived in Upland. So that's kind of a drive going back this way. And then they had to, but we were going to watch the children when Kathy went into labor. So they bring them to our house. And, uh, but they have to go all the way back, like towards Whittier, 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 Whittier to, uh, for the birth. Well, Scott, he's a real easygoing guy. And he said, but he said, you know, Kathy, he says, those the first two labors you had were kind of long. I'm kind of hungry as he leaves our house. He goes through Jack in the Box to get himself a couple of tacos. It's a true story. And uh, they're going down the freeway now, and she goes, Scotty, I think the baby's coming. You better hurry. 
and she said, my window's down, I'm screaming out as we're passing cars and we're now we're driving very quickly. He said, we get to the hospital, Scott ran up to the emergency and he says, my wife's in the car, she had the baby, which is literally what happened. He said, I'm driving 90 miles an hour, delivering a baby here. And the, the, the nurses said, your wife's in the car, she's gonna have a baby. He says, no, my wife's in the car, we had a baby. He said, they ran by her, ran by him real fast. I say that to say this, we think we know sometimes where the baby's gonna be born. Jesus knew exactly, God knew exactly where he would be born. What are the possibilities that that could happen, that one person would fit into all those categories? I love this stuff, mathematician, I think I mentioned this before, a guy named Peter Stoner, he investigated this. And instead of looking at 300 different prophecies being fulfilled, he said, let's just take eight. Let's just take eight prophecies. And he said, what are the odds of that being fulfilled? He concluded that the chances were one in 10 to the 17th power. Dana, what, is, what number is that? What is the 17th power, what, quadrillion? Would that be the one? So you have million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, right? So it would be like one in 100 quadrillion the odds of that happening for just eight prophecies. But we're talking 300 prophecies. You know, this Bible is full of things and prophecies that God has fulfilled to, to prove and to show that he is truly God. To, you, to give us a, another way of looking at this, if you took a silver dollar, anybody have silver dollars they're hanging on to at the house? Yeah, yeah, I've got silver dollars somewhere, I think. But at any rate, the silver dollars, that's kind of a neat looking coin. I like the silver dollar. But the, somebody said that if you took silver dollars and, and, and if, if you had 100 quadrillion silver dollars, it would cover the state of Texas two feet deep. Two feet deep. And then if you took one and you marked a red X on it and you had somebody throw it into the pile then you take somebody and you blindfold them and you go out and you tell them, I want you to find that silver dollar in this two foot deep pile throughout the state of Texas on the first try, on the first try. Can you imagine that? And yet that's just eight prophecies. Now if you start to multiply that out by 300 prophecies, I don't think the number exists. I think that it will have a, a whole lot of zeros behind it. God was born back some 2,000 years ago. Some 2,000 years ago. See, these prophecies, these prophecies establish his identity. These prophecies tell us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God this morning. And the miracles demonstrate his power. How has it impacted you today? Has it changed your life? You sit here this morning, you claim to know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. How has that impacted you? His power to change your life. He's always fashioning us. We were talking in class this morning. We're to bring honor and glory to the Lord, to God. That's our goal, our sole purpose, to bring honor and glory. How do you do that? By walking in his path, by following his leadership living by his statues, allowing him to fashion you? Are you placing yourself on the altar? I go back to, if Jesus isn't your savior, Christmas is not your holiday. Oh, it's a fun holiday. There'll be parties and there'll be uh, gifts exchange and all that, but it's not your holiday. I'm gonna have every head bowed and every eye closed.